Praise the Lord. Grace. Hallelujah. I received it from Him unworthily, but He gave it to me anyway. Aren't you thankful for God's grace? Thank you, praise team. Why don't we give the Lord just another great praise on a Wednesday night? He's a good God. He's a really, really good God. Amen. He's a good God. Only part of me. Someone said, Well, I like that guy. He's a good guy. I said, well, I think there's two great lies perpetrated upon man, perhaps the two greatest. And that is that in some way man is good and that there is no hell. I think those are the two greatest lies. Why call you me good? There is none good, he said. Nobody's good. Matter of fact, me without Jesus. Ooh. Me with just a little bit less of Jesus. You, you don't want to be in that left hand lane going 75. You, you don't want to get my order wrong, make me wait too long if I don't have Jesus. Even with Jesus, sometimes I have to go back. Jesus makes me say, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm thankful for the Holy Ghost. I'm thankful for the church, for these wonderful people. Amen. You're the greatest. Look at your neighbor say, you're doing a great job. Now we've practiced what we're supposed to do when that happens. There it is. Come on, you don't let the devil win. I'm glad it happened on a Wednesday night. The lights go out. The sound blows up. We don't, come on, we praise God. We don't let the devil win. We don't let, come on, technological problems win. The devil is a liar. Come on. Yeah. Hallelujah. Mark 8 and 22. We're going to read through 23, 24, and 25. Buy all those t-shirts. We use the, the proceeds from the bookstore to fund the... Uh, sound so uh, we need y'all to buy all the t-shirts amen <laughs> it's a radio frequency that that we've we're battling with and we've replaced all the microphones just a few years ago and um, I don't know who at the Biden administration is working no, I'm just kidding it's probably not him but working against us but uh I'm like, we're not buying all new microphones. We'll just figure it out. Amen. We'll go a little, a little longer. These things are expensive, by the way. So, um, yeah, it's crazy. Mark 8 and 22. But I like it a whole lot better than those ones with cords. Like, man, you were bound. I'd get tangled up in them. You know, like, oh, thank God we don't have those anymore. Amen. And he cometh to Bethsaida. Just a simple thought. We're coming into a, an incredible time of faith, and God's going to speak to us and our faith will grow. Faith is the substance, amen, of things hoped for. Amen. It means it's the tangible. Amen. What you hope becomes tangible, through, but only through faith. And so people say, well, I've, I've never seen it. Well, it's the evidence of things not seen. So the only way you're going to see it is to believe it. The reason you haven't seen it yet is because you don't believe it. It's not I see it and believe it. It's I believe it and I see it. That's how faith works. And so you, if you will allow God to grow your faith, you know what you'll be able to see? Things you've never seen before. Somebody say, well, I don't believe in all that speaking in tongues. You know the only people that I've ever heard say that are people that didn't speak in tongues. <laughs> but when they speak in tongues, they start saying, man, I tell you what, that's about the best thing I've ever done. I, I don't like all that owl running. You know the only people that don't like owl running are people that don't run owls. You know the people don't like, come on, dancing are the people that don't dance. People don't like shouting are the people that don't like, but when they start shouting, they start seeing. When they start running, they get revelation. When they start dancing, all of a sudden there comes clarity. You got to just believe it to see it. So if you're a visitor here today wondering what's going on, I encourage you to let your faith grow. You'll see. <laughs> And he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand, and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes, 
and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. And after that, he put his hands again on his eyes and made him look up. And he was restored and saw every man clearly, every man clearly. The miracle business is messy. Look at your neighbor and say, if you want miracles, it's going to get messy. <laughs> ministry means to serve, to which all of us have been called. Ministry is messy. Ministry is dirty. And, but I want to see the miraculous happen in my life. Amen. I want it to happen in my life. Lord, anoint your word. Help me to do a good job. In Jesus' name, you can be seated. I've been preaching over 20 years, and um, this man here at Bethsaida who is blind, and all of I was looking through my notes, my memory, and uh, all I can find to recollect is that I have preached on him a singular time. On the contrary, I've preached about blind Bartimaeus innumerable times. It was my first uh, sermon was about blind Bartimaeus as, as it is most preachers. It's either that or the lady with the issue of blood. They get preached. They're famous. You know what I mean? And uh, uh, so he gets overlooked a little bit. It, it seems as you study scripture and the miraculous that the, the healing of the blind is one of the most common things that Jesus does. It seems as if he is continually healing blind people. As I said, two chapters later, after this man is healed of blindness, we find the, the celebrity Bartimaeus getting healed uh, of his blindness. Uh, uh, but I, I want us to look to this evening for this, the sake of understanding and ministry uh, quickly at this man who's less famous but blind at Bethsaida. Um, he's blind and he's at this place called Bethsaida simply for the reason that Jesus was there. And he knew if, and they knew if we can get him to Jesus, he, he can be healed. And so he is present in the presence of Jesus. However, we know that he is blind. He is blind. Uh, so we have to ask our question, how did he get to this place where Jesus, how did he, how did he know where Jesus was and how did he get there? Because if you're blind, how do you find Jesus? The answer is in the text in 22, nothing deep tonight, just a simple thought. And he cometh to Bethsaida and they bring a blind man unto Jesus. Look at your neighbor and say, they brought the blind man. I know that the Bible, there's not enough space in the Bible to give honor where honor is rightfully due in context, in, in, in specific names. But if there are some names I wish I would, could know and some people that I think are worthy of honor, it's the they. I said the they because the only reason this man is in the Bible, the only reason this man gets to see is because he had some they. This man is not healed unless he has a they. Come on. And so I searched the Bible and I typed in the word they. It came up 5,469 times. We in for a long night. But I've ADD, so you're cool. We're going to get through this. I'm like, 5,000, I ain't looking at all that. I don't have time for that. <laughs> so I, I punched in me 3,080 times. Almost twice as many times does it talk about they as it does me. Us, there's 1,091. Mine, 588. Jo Joseph found his way into Pharaoh's house uh, where he would save the land. He's familiar. We all know about Joseph because without him, we, we would not be here today. He's the saver, the rescuer of God's people. The Bible says that he is in a prison cell in Pharaoh in 41 and 14 of Genesis. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon and shaved him and changed his garment and he came into Pharaoh. He knew coming into the king's house, you got to shave and put on some clean clothes, amen? So, so anyway, we got, that's another Bible study, but it's a good one, amen? Joseph isn't saving the world without they. As grand as Joseph's dreams were, and as powerful as they were, and as the vision and the promise that was on his life, it is all muted if he had a I don't need nobody kind of attitude. Well, you know what? I'll just believe for God on my own. Ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. Ain't nobody going to tell you what to do, Mr. Blind Man. Then guess what? You're never going to get to your destiny because the only way you get to destiny is if you got a they. 
Ooh, hey neighbor, I know you might not be as smart as me, but there's some things I can't see in me, so I'm gonna trust the they. They, I said they. Come on, preacher. This is your church and you're gonna build a revival. This isn't Brother Chuddle's church. This is their church. This is the church of the living God, the people of God. In Exodus 36 and 3, and they received of Moses all their offering, uh, which the children of Israel had brought uh, for the work of the service of the sanctuary to make it with all, and they brought yet uh, unto him uh, free offerings every morning. Uh, number 7 and 3, and they brought their offering uh, before the Lord, six covered wagons uh, and 12 oxen, a wagon for two of the princes and for each one an ox, and they brought them before the tabernacle. Uh, you know about Dorcas or Tabernacle, Tabitha in Acts chapter 9 in verse 39 she is, uh, she is dead but the Bible says then Peter arose and went with them when he was come and they brought him into the upper chamber and all the widows stood by him weeping and showing the coats and the garments uh, which Dorcas made uh, while she was with him and he raises her from the dead you know why because he had some theys uh, that could take don't you know Dorcas woke up and said thank God I wasn't the lone ranger so cocky and arrogant and narcissistic narcissistic that I didn't think I needed a, a church family but no I'll submit myself to, to God I'll submit myself to his man and I'll submit myself to the body because I need the body yeah. hallelujah 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 and so I, I'm just going to stop right here to pause again and say that there's no Matthew Tuttle without they my ministry doesn't happen without they. I, I don't want to, to, to live my life and my children not know that it is the they's in my life uh, that go without honor. I'm going to honor they. I'm going to honor my father. You so say, you always preach about your dad and your mom? Yeah. You know why? Because without a pastor, come on, that loved me and corrected me, without a mother uh, that raised me uh, to, to love truth and righteousness, uh, there's no preacher, Matthew Tuttle. You don't have a pastor, come on, named Matthew Tuttle. I'll tell you why I'm here today is because I've got a they and I think in its simplicity come on I'm not going deep tonight I'm just giving honor to where it's rightfully due and they are worthy of it uh, thank God for everything Eastgate is I'm thankful for the beautiful everything we have and all that we possess uh, I'm thankful for the choir and the sound and well thankful for the choir and I'm thankful for the sound these are ma sound magicians do you know most churches our size have a $100,000 soundboard? We have a $2,500 soundboard. We don't need $100,000 to kick the devil in the teeth. We got hands. And, come on. They said, we need a more expensive soundboard. I said, no, we just need a louder church. You don't need an expensive soundboard when you got a loud church. You don't need a lot of, come on. I said, we've got mouths and lips and tongues and we can make noise unto the Lord. I say, we stop him in the ground with a $2,500 board. Prove him wrong. The devil is a liar. And I'm thankful. I look up, I see Lance Lofton sound because of Mike Pickering. That's the they. The men of God that carried this. I, the name, Brother Hoyt, a man that pastored before Brother Edwards, let his name not be unknown to the children that are raised in our Sunday school classes. Let the legacy of Bishop and Sister Ed Edwards never die. Let it live on because upon their shoulders we stand tall tonight because they had a vision. Let every board member that is a part of the they that stood for holiness, one God, Jesus' name, apostolic truth. When the winds come on of adversity blue, we say thank you. Thank God there's a church. Thank God. God, there's a they. I wonder, I wonder if you could look back in the rearview mirror of your life and say, I'm only here. Maybe it was a little Sunday school teacher that got into your mind and brought you the revelation of who Jesus is. But can you give God thanks? Can you give God thanks for your they? There was somebody. Come on, there's somebody in your life. There's a group of people in my life and I could go down that list of people that are significant in the formation of who I am to realize we're not an island as is no man. When I was dating my wife, every time, I don't know why he said it, maybe now I do, I'd come to visit my father-in-law. He'd get up and say, well, we're good to have, glad to have Brother Turtle here. I'm like, well, I'm gonna tell you, 
he's original. Never heard that before. You think I grew up being called Tuttle and it wasn't Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle? I mean, come on, I've been Donatello, Michael, I've been all of them. He's like, you know, and he'd look at me, he said, you know, if you see a turtle on a fence post, he didn't get there by himself. I said, well, I, I, I heard you the first 713 times, but I got you now. Now I'm 42 and I got it. You're right, it's true. You see somebody up, you see a church rising, you see somebody that's attaining anything, you got to know that there's some they's in their lives. There's some they's in their lives. And so if we can agree, celebrate, high five, commend and honor those they's that brought us to this place, we must be humble enough to recognize that we cannot transfer or transition to the next place without some they's if you needed a they to get you here you're going to need a they to get you there what are you saying I'm saying you've come too far to let go of what got you here now that the same group of people that got you out of sin is going to get you in to purpose. Don't you turn and start getting an attitude now. You Come on, isn't it crazy? Same people you, that are hating on us uh, you are the ones that they got brought out by us. But I'm never going to get so good. We don't ever get so grand that we say, well, Eastgate doesn't need fellowship anymore. And we don't have to connect to the organization anymore. And, and I don't need anybody over me anymore. And I don't need, no, 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 no. We always are going to need a they. Preacher, tell me who they are. Tell me who is my they. Okay, here's what I need you to do. I want to introduce you to your, your they. Please stand to your feet. It will require you to stand to your feet. It will require a little bit of effort, this introduction. It's going to be an introduction for you. I need you to take your feet and to take at least 15 to 20 steps and find somebody, grab them in by both hands, and look them in the eyeballs. Be silent just long enough to where it's awkward. grab both hands looking somebody you don't normally look at dude with a dude probably better woman with a woman mm, don't sound like I'm going to tell you we can't be holy quiet we can't even be awkward quiet alright now I didn't say meet and greet be quiet shh looking at him I know y'all had to talk because it's weird staring at another dude in the eyes holding his hands now look at him and say, you are my they. I need you. I can't have revival without you. I can't move into my purpose without you. I thank God for you. I thank God. Don't you quit, because I need you to make it to where I'm going. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying the man holding your hand is the man that holds your purpose. The lady holding your hand is the lady that holds your destiny. I need you. I need you for you are my they. Come on, you're not just group, part of this group of people for no reason. You're part of this thing to be part of the they. There's an apostle Paul that they is raising up. I said there's an apostle Paul. There's, there's an Esther. You might just be the they that drives the van, but you're driving an Esther. You might be the they that teaches her in Sunday school, but there's a next T.W. Barnes sitting in your youth class. You're the they that stands out the door and welcomes in the next Peter. You're the they, come on. You're the they that teaches the hyphen class and raises up the next missionary that has the greatest harvest. You're the they that goes to the young marriage and connects with somebody you don't know because you're raising up a couple that'll reach into a nation that's never been reached before. You are the they. Woo! Perhaps my name is not recorded in history. Perhaps the name Matthew Tuttle is unknown to the generations if the Lord tarries 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 years from now. But when they speak of the revival in southeast Texas in the early 20s, ah, and, and, and they say there was a group 
they change their world. I want to be standing on the edge of heaven's balcony saying I'm part of them. I'm part of them. I'm fine being part of they. Just make sure it's a big miracle. Let me be part of they. Well, I need the credit. I need to be recognized. Okay, Revelation 7 and 11. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces, worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power might be to God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these that are arrayed in white robes and from whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. These are they, therefore, that before the throne of God serve him day and night in his temple, and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall no hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat for the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed they and shall lead them unto living fountains of water and God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes. There's a reward for the day. It's called heaven. Heaven is your reward. Get me in a van. Put me in a Sunday school class. Get me up in the choir. Get me at the door. Just get me a part of the day. I want the reward that comes with they. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't, 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 don't let your vanity hold back a thank you from the they. Don't let your insecurity hinder you from saying, I, I didn't do this on my own. Come on. I know that. In case y'all are worried, when they get up here and say, man, we're so glad to be here at Brother Tuttle's church and he's doing a great job. I'm sitting over there going, I know. I know I didn't do all this on my own. I know that, come on, I don't even know how to turn the lights on. I don't know how to turn the sound system on. Somebody's like, do you want to know? I said, no, I don't want to know. Be one more thing I'd have to do. I don't, they know how to turn the sound on. I said, that way if the sound's bad, I can be like, yeah, it's their fault. You know what I'm saying? I don't know how to unlock locks of the doors. I don't know the code to the air conditioning machine. I didn't want to know that either because y'all always complaining about it. It's too hot. I'm like, it's hot for me too. It's awful. Come on. I know that without they, there is no Eastgate. But it's going to be worth it all. It's going to be worth it all. It's going to be worth it all. I just believe that your ministry could take off if, if you'd stop worrying so much about getting credit and recognition. Every miracle, almost every miracle, many miracles, not every, but many are preceded by the words they in your Bible. Seems like they play a big part in me being who I am and me getting healed. Amen? So I, I'm at a place, and I believe God has brought together a people at Eastgate Church who are happy to be part of they. I think end time revival is coming to this group. But man, I see a Tommy Gunner. I'm so proud of the Gunners. Amen. Out there, second mile. Come on. Uh, reaching into the streets. Uh, come on. Our second mile had an incredible service. Uh, I wasn't part of it because I was somewhere else doing something else. But, but I'm thankful that we had an entire, come on, I was 70 people out on the streets uh, reaching for hurting people. And the Bible says that, that they brought the blind man to Jesus. The Bible says that when they brought him to Jesus, Jesus took him by the hand. Thank you all for bringing him. And the Bible says that he took him out of town. That's what the Bible says. What are you saying? I brought him. I think I deserve to be a part of it. 
yeah I'm going to work a miracle you're not even going to get to see it are, are you cool not only do you not get the credit named you don't even get to see it but that's fine there's one less blind man in the world you know when it hit me it hit me this morning when Nicole McCormick texted me and said I made it to Greece and I thought ain't that the way it works I mean, I've spent a lot of money on Christian school. I've spent eight years training her, developing her, working on her, got her at my house. I mean, I have worked to develop that girl into it. She is awesome, and, and, and I'm part of the they that made her awesome. And Joey, you're part of the they that made her awesome. And David and Monica, come on, and Kim and Mickey. And, and this church has made Nicole McCormick an awesome young lady. And you know what God did? He said, thank you very much. I'm going to take her and let her be used in a place and y'all don't even get to see it. But I wonder, are we cool enough to say if God calls our kids to the mission field, they're yours, God. We're just wanting to be part of the day. We're just wanting to be part of the advancement of God in this generation. So Jesus, here's my children. Here's my money. Here's my time. Here's my energy. You take it. You do whatever you want to do with it I just want to be part of the day hallelujah hallelujah you can take my miracle as long as I'm part of a miracle that's why we got him get to heaven the Bible says that we will understand and know as he knows that's where you'll get to see it that's why you'll take that crown and throw it down at his feet And the Bible says that he took him out of town. It was they time that got him there. But it was alone time with Jesus where the miracle happened. The combination for the miraculous. You got to have a they. But a they does not excuse you from a time with just him. The combination for the miraculous in your home, your family, your life, and your body is the corporate body working together but we are also individuals the day of Pentecost begins and they were all in one place in one accord that means that they were together in church and the Holy Ghost came and sat upon each one of them it was an individual experience in a corporate setting what I'm saying is the corporate setting does not alleviate or should I say eliminate the need for personal devotion but if you put those two together that's where the miracle is the miracle is you come and you commit I said we can, we can get you to Jesus but what will open your eyes is what you do alone with Jesus what will open your eyes and bring the miracle in your life is what you do on your daily 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 time if you've got come on you've got to have a prayer life you got to I can't be the dude that reads the Bible to you on Sundays and on Wednesdays you've got to get this sucker open every day and if you'll open up every day I'll lead you to the right place you just start doing it on your own and you'll start seeing things you've never seen before and so I, I have to get alone with God if you're, you're in ministry in any way you don't prepare to preach to people you prepare to live for God and out of what you prepare for you God come on there's people that only prepare for the they oh it's a combination what happens next is crazy Jesus spits on him this is an incredible lesson and it's an incredible lesson for ministry church leadership he said well I'm not a church leader if you've been in this for longer than about 24 hours we need you to go ahead and step on up Jesus is coming back come on now everybody's a recruit tonight and every one of us are part of leadership what well what am I leading a lost soul to Jesus And if you're going to be in the ministry business, 
you you got to realize you're going to get spit on. Spit's going to happen. Mm -hmm. He wasn't in a bar. He wasn't in a club. He wasn't with sinners. He wasn't even with saints. He was with Jesus. And if you have been doing this a little while, you're going to figure out you're going to get spit on along the way. He said, I, I, I know. I got some amens on that one. You know what it's like to get hit with spit. Some people are like, well, man, you know, the healing powers of saliva. There's, there's literally people that, like, if you studied it, they think that it was the, the healing powers of, of Jesus' saliva that healed them. <laughs> if that was the case, he'd have spit on all of them. His saliva was about like your saliva. <laughs> Me just doing that makes you want to throw up. And you feel it. It's got a little crunchy stuff in it. There's still a 15-year-old boy trapped in this 42-year-old body. I got to do it. I got to say it. I got to say it. <laughs> it ain't got nothing to do. It got nothing to do with some kind of healing thing in his spit. It's nasty. It's just straight up nasty. I said it's nasty. I don't care if it's Jesus spit. I don't care if it's Bishop Edward spit. I don't care if it's T.W. Barnes spit. It's spit. You don't spit on people. You don't spit on people. It's nasty. It's messy. It's gross and disgusting. And it's with the people I never thought would do it. But boy, doesn't that just describe ministry and bringing people to Jesus. If you're going to be part of the they along the way. Because <clears throat> ministry can be messy and nasty. Come on, you're going to end up with spit running down your face. But I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm humble enough to honor my they. And I'm willing to be alone with God. And I'm also willing to allow some spit from others hit me. He didn't spit on his shoe, he didn't spit on his torso. He spit right up in his face, right up in his eye. It's on purpose. Can, can, now, I was reading this today and I thought, can you imagine the 2023 snowflake? <laughs> you know, for real, like, can you imagine if they got spit on? by Jesus by, by a spiritual leader come on <clears throat> well my goodness uh, you know what that just really hurt my feelings and I don't appreciate the way that I was disrespected there and so I don't normally post this but I've just got to tell you the way that they treated me down there y'all know what I'm talking about They would have been gone quick and in a hurry. So fast. Be like, poof, come on. But if you're going to make it to the miracle place, you got to realize it's going to get messy. You got to know there's going to be some spit from people you didn't expect. But I'm going to tell you what's even more frustrating is two chapters later, superstar Bart, he getting hit. he's getting healed. Everybody likes to preach about him getting healed. You know why? I figured out why. He don't get spit on. He All he had to do was go, Jesus! And we love that part, don't we? Man, we're real good with, oh yeah, I can do that. And man, we're Pentecostals professional shouters. Jesus! Shout a little louder and the walls come down. Shout a little louder. Shout till he can hear you. Jesus! And I'm all about it. The question is, can you shout? You can shout. The question is, can you handle the spit? Because maybe, maybe your miracle doesn't come by shouting. Maybe the miraculous happens by you being able to handle some stuff. Well, why is he spitting on me and not spitting on him? Why are they treating me like they're treating him? Well, he got to preach five minutes at fire after he was only here for three years and I've been here for 30. I don't know. Come on. Come on. 
And here's what you've got to learn. And here's what this man teaches me is I can't compare my miracle to his miracle. Let me teach you and tell you, I, this is, you know it, but I'm going to remind you that the robber of joy in 2023, the greatest thief of joy in our world is comparison. And social media is a compare factory. Come on. My kids still aren't on it. They're not going to be on it till they're adults. You know what's crazy is I'm seeing now psychologists and modern thinkers are agreeing with that children, young children should not be on social media. I think in a few years they're going to say no one should be on it. And here's why. Because it's a giant compare factory. You cannot look at it and not compare his truck to, well, you know what? I mean, you've got to stop comparing your ministry to my ministry I've got to stop comparing my family to your family I've got to stop come on you've got to stop comparing your husband to her husband you don't know what he's like behind closed doors you don't know what it's really like when they turn the camera off come on they and all it does is breed jealousy in your heart and now you're saying well I don't know why let me tell you the thing about jealousy jealousy gets people asking why when they should be asking how. Come on, you know somebody more successful than you? Instead of sitting there saying, well, I don't know why, you should say, how did you do that? Come on, when I go to a church and they've got blowing the roof off and things are having revival, I don't go in and say, well, my goodness, I don't know why they did it. Well, the reason why is because I'm in a small town. I go in and say, how did you do it? Because I see somebody with more money than me, I go up to them and say, hey, dude, what are you doing? Come on, that's, I'm off my notes, but I'm just giving you a little lesson there. If you notice that she's got a really good marriage, maybe you ought to go to her and say, hey, how do you treat your husband at night? Come on, do you, do you gripe and complain and moan and groan? And Come on. I bet you she don't. I bet you she doesn't. I bet you she's got, she, her husband comes home and gets a big fat hug and maybe a little more. I'm off my notes, but I'll preach on for you, men. I can help your marriage out, young lady. I can help your marriage out, ma'am. Come on. Come on, when he comes home, let's not make it gripe, 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 gripe. Hey, man, when's the last time you took her on a hot date? When's the last time you told her she was incredible, sat down, took time, didn't need physical, but spent time in communication? You know what? I learned some of that stuff by talking to dudes that had good marriages. I said, how did you do it? Well, this is how I did it. All right, well, that's how you do it. I'm gonna do it. I'm not so vain to think that I can break the laws of God, man, and experience. Come on, y'all get nervous. I know y'all get nervous. But if you're not, let me, let me just say this. This is the adults. If you're not having sex with your spouse on a regular basis, you're in sin. I know nobody can clap. But you come into my office, first question I'm going to ask you, ma'am, sir, is when's the last time y'all had sexual relations? And normally what they say 100% of the time, they're like, I look at him, I say, that's your problem. Come on, somebody. Some of y'all know it's right because you've been in my office. And I had one of them, I, I did originally. I asked her, I said, when's the last time you had sex? She said, oh, I said that's your problem. She said, well, he's not. I said, I don't care. You're in my office, he's not. If he was in my office, I'd say, when's the last time y'all went on a hot date and she, you bought her flowers and took her out to Houston and did something cool? Uh, that's your problem <laughs> well if she would just make passionate love to me well she's not in my office if she was I'd tell her to do that <laughs> so I told her I said you go take care of business and when you know you know now y'all look we in, the, we in the church and the Bible talks about sex read your Bible ah I said you know how to make it happen you grown woman <laughs> I said, you go make it happen, come back in a week if it ain't fixed, and we'll talk about another plan. Two months later, she ain't been back to my office. I'm over here in the altar one time just, just shouting in the Holy Ghost. I look over, and we make eye contact. I'm like, 
you good? She's like, we good, we good. I'm not saying it fixes everything, but I'm saying that a healthy relationship should be, it should be a part of a healthy relationship. Oh, I can't believe he's talking about sex. Well, Hollywood gets to talk about it. Everybody else gets to pervert it. It's a beautiful thing that's wonderful that keeps a marriage together. And if it's not happening in yours, wife, it's happening somewhere else. It's happening in his mind and it ain't good. Ah, my wife's gonna get on to me, so I gotta get on the men. Hey, I'm going to tell you something. You want that dude to buy you chocolates? You have more chocolates that you could eat in a whole lifetime. Hey, dude, you want that to happen? You know what to do. Come on. How'd you get her convinced to live the rest of her life with you? You didn't do it by being an idiot. Bless God, I, I worked all day. She worked too, cleaning up your stinky underwear. Come on. Come on. They're so stinky, you didn't wash them when you were single. You threw them in the trash and bought new ones at Walmart. And you know I'm telling the truth. You said, I, man, I ain't messing with that. I'm going down there to buy me some more. Come on. She ain't going down there to buy some more. She's picking them up and washing them and putting them in your drawer and taking care of you and loving you and cooking meals for you and taking time for you. When you walk through that door, you ought to show some appreciation for it and say, man, baby, you're the most beautiful looking thing I've ever seen. I know we've been together 35 years, but man, you're better looking today. Oh, you fine, fine all the time. I, I did a, oh man, three minutes. I did a series on this in Holland. I called it God and Sex. And it was for only for married people. Largest attended session of all times. It was awesome. <laughs> I mean, I was teaching it, so I loved it, you know what I mean? That's why we got that clock Because when you're talking The time goes faster Than when you're listening I'm aware That's why I have You're like I want to hear you preach No you don't Every once in a while You want me to have some visitors That way I have to be a listener You're like Put yourself in this pain position Preacher So you know what we got to go through While you up there Amen But them dudes ain't talking about sex That, that shouldn't even count Against my time Tommy That should be like Pastor roll it on back Because you was giving us A good talk right there God, You ought to thank God You got a pastor Talk a little bit About what Hollywood's perverted What po politicians have perverted Come on It's a great thing It's a beautiful thing There's nothing more beautiful Matter of fact He says he's the groom And we're the bride He compares his relationship To ours with marriage What was I preaching about again, Michelle? The what? The miracle of the blind man at Bethsaida. Nah, that's not what I'm preaching about because the, the miracle isn't that he got healed. The miracle is that he didn't leave. Think about it real big. He got spit on. And the miracle is he didn't spit back. The miracle is he didn't talk back. The miracle, because let's just be real honest. Let's just get right down to where we really live. If you come over and spit on me, let's just be honest. It ain't going to be spit coming back your way. You're going to wake up in St. E. You might be waking up at Memorial. Don't spit on me. So the miracle isn't that he's blind and he can see. The miracle is he didn't walk away. How many miracles could I have had? If I just didn't walk away 
how many of us know and can all say, yeah, if they would have just stayed, dried the spit off, they would be part of the miracle today. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying along the journey of life in ministries, you help people and they hurt you. And they spit on you. Wipe the spit off. And keep on. Because the miracle business is messy. How do I survive it, pastor? You stay. You stay, you stay, you stay. And the longer you stay, the more miracles you'll see. What are you saying? I'm saying all you got to do to see a miracle is plant yourself and say, come hell, come high water, come good times, come bad times. If they hit on me, if they spit on me, if they kick me, when it's high and when it's low, I'm not going. I'm here for the miracle. I'm here for the miracle. Can you see? He said, I see, but it's, it's fuzzy. He's, he's kind of disappointed and probably a little hurt. He's been spit on. And so he has, he has trees, giant trees. He's turned this thing into a mountain. It's just human size, but he's got it live oak tree size. <laughs> when you get spit on, it can't hurt you. And it'll make you blow things way out of proportion. You know what I'm talking about? You, you don't make marriage decisions, change churches. You don't move your house when you're hurt. Because when you're hurt, things that aren't that big of a deal look way bigger than they really are. But what you do, seeing some people, they've been walking with Jesus for years. They've, they've been out, they've been with the they, they've been alone with him. And they, they, they want everybody to think that they can see everything God does crystal clear. But the truth of the matter is, no matter how long you serve God and live with God, for God, there's going to be times where uh, I've been hurt and I'm seeing things a little fuzzy. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to be part of the they. I'm going to be willing to be alone with him. I'm going to allow people to spit on me. I'm not going anywhere. And every time there's an altar call, I'll be right up here saying, Lord, touch me one more time. Touch me. What's the solution to getting over that and allowing me to see the reality and not the tree? Touch me one more time. Touch me just one more time. And when he touched him again, I'm thankful you can tell me about that time back in 1973 when he touched you, but I want to know, did, can he touch you again? Thank God. He se- Come on, we're celebrating the revival that brought us to this building, but I'm ready for him to touch us again. I'm so glad that on Sunday night, come on, Brother Bridger preached, and I was stirred, and I laid down there, and I prayed, and I spoke in tongues, but it's Wednesday night, and my hands are up, and I'm saying, touch me again. Touch me again. Again, I've been through the turmoil of life. Monday hit me hard and Wednesday was a challenge. Tuesday was a little bit of a battle and I need you to touch me again. As we conclude this Wednesday night Bible study, come on, you've got to make up your mind. I'm going to be willing to be part of they. I'm not so insecure. I can't give credit to those that came before me. And I realize I'll need them to move to where I'm going. I recommit my devotion, my daily life, my dedication to him. I'm going to do it. I'm going to let people and understand that I will be hurt along the journey. People are going to say things and do things to me. And then I'm going to make up my mind to remain planted. I'm not leaving, I'm not going anywhere. Come on, the devil can come with some spiritual solutions that are not spiritual at all. And let me leaving the place of the miraculous is never the solution. Stay with Jesus. Stay next to Jesus. Stay next to Jesus. And then I'm not just satisfied to stand here next to you. Jesus with spit running down my face. Touch me again. And I'm going to see the miraculous. I wonder if you could lift your hands. Come on, if you're a visitor here and you want somebody to pray with you, just raise your hands. There's somebody that'll see your hand go up. And they'll lay their hand on your shoulder. Come on. 
if you're a saint of God that's been in this for longer than half an hour, throw your hands up and say, I spoke in tongues last weekend. I spoke in tongues yesterday. I broke through in the spirit then, but I need it again. I need it again and again and again and again. I need it again. Come on, as we go into a month of faith, harvest and revival, whatever that brings, whether it's faith that comes through the convicting preaching, whether it's faith that comes, come on, through expository, topical preaching, whether it's stories of testimonies of those that overcome, whatever it is, whatever it is, God, grow my faith and touch me again. Touch me again. Touch me again. That's it across this building. Somebody's finding somebody. I wonder if they could go to work right now. I wonder if they could lay their hands on somebody. Go ahead and be part of the day. Find a blind man. Find a withered up hand. Find somebody that looks like they're broken. Find somebody that looks like they've got it all together. You don't know, but lay your hand on them. Let them feel the weight of your arms. Let them feel, come on, your voice as it speaks. Come on, it's midweek. We're getting through it. I'm going to go through it. I'm going to go through it. I'm going to go through it. Come on, some of you got hit this week. You got spit on. Mm. Don't you retaliate. Wipe it off. It's a messy business. But you don't give up. Oh, that's it. 